ready to respond. President Donald Trump is considering military action against Iran. We have a report and reaction. Fight for the unborn, a decision in the battle over Missouri's only abortion clinic. We have the latest. Teaching theology, why the Holy Father is seeking to make academic changes to some Catholic universities. And the Last Supper, analysis of how a 16th century Italian artist depicted a famous scene in Christianity. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, June 21st, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. A Vatican official is begging the United States and Iran to step back from escalating tensions in the Persian Gulf. Cardinal Peter Turkson is calling for an increase in political friendship. He writes on Twitter, quote, On our knees, let's pray USA and Iran do not unsheath the weapons of war. Cardinal Turkson is the head of the Holy See's Development and Migrant Department. President Donald Trump says today he called off an airstrike against Iran with only minutes to spare. He did so after being told 150 people could die. It could have been, it would have been in retaliation for the Revolutionary Guard shooting down an unmanned U.S. drone they claim was over Iranian airspace. And lawmakers on Capitol Hill are reacting to the rising tensions with Iran. Correspondent Jason Calvi joins us with more. Jason. Wyatt, it's been a wild 24 hours with many questions still remaining tonight. How should the United States respond to Iran shooting down an American drone? President Trump yesterday summoned top aides and congressional leaders to the Situation Room at the White House. And after the president says that he was on the verge of striking. Iran says these are pieces of the drone they shot down. In this Iranian general says they targeted the unmanned drone instead of a nearby spy plane with 35 people in it. The U.S. says the drone was flying in international waters. Iran claims it was their airspace. President Trump tweeted today, we were cocked and loaded to retaliate. When I asked how many will die, 150 people, sir, was the answer from a general. Ten minutes before the strike, I stopped it. Republican Matt Gates tells me he's glad the trigger wasn't pulled. Well, I hope that we don't go to war with Iran. And the president hopes that we don't go to war with Iran, so we'll see. Senator Marco Rubio says Iran's shoot down was an act of war. But the administration, I think, has been prudent and patient and has made it clear that we're not there to start a war, but we will respond to attacks on Americans and on our interests. I also believe that we as America need to deal with our adversaries in a peace through strength type of method. I believe in the Reagan doctrine, and that's what I certainly hope President Trump does too. Tensions are extremely high. What we want to see is the easing of the tension. We would like to see uh, a recognition that, uh, first of all, we don't want to see any military um, confrontation. Nations like Iran, Russia, China, North Korea aggressors respect strength. They exploit weakness, and we have to show strength and resolve. Some lawmakers say they want to weigh future action. So uh, I'm hoping that the administration comes back to Congress. We'll have a conversation. We'll make sure that we talk to our, have access to intelligence. We'll sit down, go to the Pentagon and talk to whoever we need to talk to there uh, so that we can make sure that we're not uh, having even uh, language differences where uh, it could be mis a miscalculation on either side. An American aircraft carrier group in the area of the Persian Gulf is standing by. President Trump vows he'll never allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Now, with these growing stresses in the area, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, is banning American planes from parts of the Persian Gulf and as well as parts of the Gulf of Oman. Now, international companies like British Airways are also detouring around the area. Wyatt? Jason, Democratic leader Adam Schiff of California has come to the president's defense. Some may find that surprising. He's a very vocal critic of the president usually, but he says, you know, be, be light on the criticism of the president in this regard. He says he's just trying to think it through, think the next actions through. But he did add that Congress has given no authority for military force against Iran. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reporting. Thanks, Jason. 
Joe Biden is pushing back against attacks from his Democratic rivals after facing criticism for describing his ability to work with segregationist senators early in his political career. The issue could come up this weekend as most Democratic presidential candidates head to South Carolina trying to woo African American voters. As he faces criticism for his comments on working with segregationist senators decades ago, Joe Biden remains defiant and unapologetic. The point I'm making is you don't have to agree. You don't have to like the people in terms of their views, but you just simply make the case and you beat them. Biden's team today doubling down. The vice president did not embrace segregationists. He doesn't praise and was not praising segregationists. Biden's initial comments, which included him saying Democratic segregationist Senator James Eastland never called me boy, he always called me son, set off a firestorm among his 2020 Democratic opponents, prompting Cory Booker to push for an apology, but the former vice president dismissing that demand. Are you going to right, apologize? Thanks, like Cory Booker apologize has for, for what? Cory Booker's called for it. Cory should apologize. apologize. He knows better. There's not a racist bone in my body. I've been involved in civil rights my whole career, period, period, period. Booker said hours later, he's not apologizing. What matters to me is that a guy running to be the head of our party, which is a significantly diverse and, and wondrous party, doesn't understand or, or can't even acknowledge that he made a mistake, whether the intention was there or not. But several members of the Congressional Black Caucus, including its chair, say Biden doesn't need to say he's sorry. I certainly wished he wouldn't have used that example. I think there's a lot of other examples of where he has worked in a bipartisan fashion. But I would like to see us move on from there. I don't know what a good an apology would serve. And Biden even getting some help from a Republican senator. Now, I don't want Joe Biden to be president for a lot of reasons. He is my friend, and what he did back then and what he will do in the future is try to find common ground with people he disagrees with. If that can't be done, America's best days are behind us. The first Democratic presidential debates are scheduled for next week. Twenty contenders will face off on a host of issues Wednesday and Thursday. Alabama Republican Roy Moore says he's running for Senate despite being asked not to by several party leaders. I fought for our country in Vietnam. I fought for our country and its laws as Chief Justice. I fought for morality to preserve our moral institutions. And I'm ready to do it again. The former judge lost a 2017 special election amid allegations he made sexual advances on young women decades ago. The seat went instead to Democrat Doug Jones. President Trump has asked Moore not to run in 2020, and the state's Republican Senator Richard Shelby says Alabama can do better. A federal appeals court allows new pro-life rules from the Trump administration to go into effect. The measures ban taxpayer-funded clinics from making abortion referrals. They also prohibit clinics receiving federal money from sharing office space with abortion providers. Nearly two dozen states sued to block the proposal, and a lower court had issued an injunction against their taking effect. Missouri's health department today decided not to renew the license for the state's only abortion clinic. But in a court hearing, a judge ruled the Planned Parenthood Clinic in St. Louis can continue to perform abortions for now. The license expired June 1st, and the court ruled the state had to either renew or deny it. The judge says he will issue a written order on what comes next. Pro-life advocates and abortion supporters held competing rallies yesterday in Wisconsin. Republican lawmakers have sent four pro-life proposals to Democratic Governor Tony Evers. He supports abortion and has promised to veto the measures. And in Rhode Island, the Catholic governor signed a bill this week that allows almost unrestricted abortion allowable under state law. It would also keep abortion legal even if Roe versus Wade is overturned. Democrat Gina Raimondo says the measure is about health care. Rhode Island has the highest percentage of Catholics of any state in the nation. Thousands of labor union members took to the streets yesterday in Peru to protest changes to labor laws. Police on horseback and armored vehicles followed the demonstrators. The workers say the new rules, backed by the country's president, will cut their salaries and vacation time. Peru is 60% Catholic. Um presidente que diz que o Estado é laico. 
And in Brazil, President Jair Bolsonaro joins hundreds of thousands of people at the March for Jesus. It's the first time the country's leader has participated in the rally, which is one of the largest evangelical events in the country. Pope Francis calls for changes in how some Catholic universities teach theology. Specifically, the Holy Father wants students to learn about dialogue with Judaism and Islam. He also calls for greater freedom in theological research and academic pursuits. Pope Francis laid out his vision during a speech at a Jesuit university in Naples, Italy. Joining me now is Courtney Grogan, Rome correspondent for Catholic News Agency. Courtney, welcome back to the broadcast. Is the Holy Father calling on all Catholic schools to study Islam and Judaism, or are there specific Catholic schools? Pope Francis' speech in Naples today applies solely to pontifical universities, that is, institutions that offer ecclesial degrees, such as the Angelicum and Gregorian universities here in Rome, where many seminarians from all over the world complete their studies in philosophy and theology. So then what is the Pope hoping to achieve in having those students learn more about Judaism and Islam? Continuing his emphasis on interreligious dialogue, Pope Francis called today for a theology of dialogue and acceptance. The Pope said that he hopes that this will foster mutual understanding between different religions and lead to peaceful coexistence in the future. Well, obviously interfaith dialogue is very important. Why do you think the Holy Father made the announcement in Naples. Pope Francis traveled to Naples today for a conference on theology in a Mediterranean context. On his previous trip to Naples in 2015, Pope Francis denounced the city's corruption and organized crimes. But today, Pope Francis praised Naples for being a special laboratory, he called it, uh, of this theology of dialogue and acceptance between different religions and cultures. Let me follow up with you on that on the, the theological aspect. In his speech, the Holy Father said theology should start from the gospel of mercy. What does he mean by the gospel of mercy? Pope Francis said today that the church needs theologians who are people of compassion and of prayer and who don't give in to the tendency in academia today to be competitive and self-reverential. Uh, Pope Francis today in particular praised the contributions of female theologians, saying that their work in theology has been indispensable and should be further supported. A lot of good examples of female theologians throughout history, and of course a lot of really important messages the Pope had to say today. Mm -hmm. Courtney Grogan, Catholic News Agency's Rome correspondent. Thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you, Wyatt. Coming up, an important anniversary in the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says he feels blessed to live in a country like the United States, which ensures religious freedom. But he says there are too many people around the world who are not able to practice their faith. People are persecuted, handcuffed, thrown in jail, even killed for their decision to believe or not to believe, for worshiping according to their conscience for teaching their children about their faith, for speaking about their beliefs in public, for gathering in private, as so many of us have done, to study the Bible, the Torah, or the Quran. Secretary Pompeo spoke today at the State Department as he unveiled their annual Religious Freedom Report. Secretary welcomed the ambassador at large for religious freedom, Sam Brownback, to talk about many of the problem areas around the world. He says many people of faith are not able to openly practice in countries like China, North Korea, Pakistan, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. The Franciscan Monastery of the Holy Land in America commemorates a milestone of interreligious dialogue. A special edition of the Holy Land Review examines the meeting in 1219 between St. Francis of Assisi and Muslim Sultan al-Maliki al-Kamil in Egypt and its lasting impact. With more on the famous meeting, we're joined by Father Michael Cusato of the Franciscan Monastery of the Holy Land in America right here in Washington, D.C. Father, welcome into the broadcast. Thank you very much. How significant was St. Francis' encounter with the Sultan? In the Middle Ages, actually, it had very little echo. 
It was a radical vision, one could almost say revolutionary vision in terms of Christian-Muslim relations. But at the time, it was such a countercultural vision that it had very little echo, even in the Franciscan order. But there are things that happened in this encounter which become extremely relevant to us today. And it's so interesting because, yeah, it's, it does play so much. So people, many people talk about it today because Pope Francis reached out to Muslim leaders, as we reported earlier. And today he called for reform in the way theology is taught in Catholic schools, saying students must learn more about in terms of interreligious dialogue between Judaism and Islam. So what example do you think St. Francis uh, does for us in terms of interreligious dialogue for the church? Well, actually, you have to start where he started, which is to say, Francis grasped the common creaturehood of both Christians, Muslims, Jews, and any human creature. If you start with the commonality of what we all share together as creatures of God, we have a, a profound basis upon which to rest an active dialogue between the various faiths. What message do you hope readers will take from the issue here of Holy Land Review and from sort of a deeper study of this meeting, which, like I said, 800 years ago now? Well, there's been a great deal of scholarship done in the last uh, two decades, let's say. And part of the impulse for the, uh, the revolutionizing of Franciscan scholarship on this issue has a lot to do with the events of 9-11. Because we realized, we Franciscans realized, that we have a story within our tradition which was very much underplayed throughout the centuries. And all of a sudden, with new eyes, we were able to see through these what are called hagiographical hey texts, texts which are kind of standardized models for how a saint should be. It mm -hmm. comes from the Middle Ages. But underneath these hagiographical hey texts, text of First Chalano, for example, Second Chalano, and Bonaventure, there is another whole layer of meaning which now, with 21st century eyes, we're able to kind of unearth and to see and to find the radical vision of Francis about how we are brothers and sisters one to another. And it starts with Francis's own conversion experience when he saw Christ in the lepers. It's such a fascinating, all the uh, historicity here is so fascinating to me. The Franciscans, of course, are known for maintaining part of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, yes. which obviously has inspired the monastery here in D.C. How does the order continue to carry out the works of St. Francis? Here in Washington, you mean? Oh, well, and around the world, especially in, in the Holy Land. Well, let's talk just about the Holy Land. Okay. Uh, of course, the, the Friars Minor have the what's called the custody of the holy places uh, in Israel, in the occupied territories, uh, in Egypt, and other places. Syria is a very important place for us, Jordan, Lebanon. Uh, we Franciscans occupy those places as guardians, if you will, of these holy sites. Uh, here in Washington, we have kind of a very unique opportunity to be a gathering point for uh, men and women of different faiths. The friars in the Holy Land try to be a kind of a neutral presence between a, a, a promoter of dialogue, if you will. And we here in Washington have the opportunity to use our neutral space mm -hmm. as a gathering point for Christians and Muslims and Jews as well, the three monotheistic faiths. We also, most particularly, even now and for many years, we have been promoting out of Washington a whole series of pilgrimages to the holy sites. Mm -hmm. Some of them, there's all kinds of different menus for going there. One can have very um, limited, if you will, among the holy places in Israel and the, and the territories. But then also there's more wide-ranging ones that go to Cyprus, that go to Lebanon, Jordan, and so forth. So uh, the friars are the great promoters of the pilgrimage, for, especially for Christians, but not exclusively for Christians, uh, in the holy places. Such an important role the Franciscans have played and continue to play in this day and age, and of course inspired by the example of St. Francis of Assisi. Father Michael Cusato of the Franciscan Monastery of the Holy Land in America, thanks so much for talking with us. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Up next, Pope Francis delivers a message to bullies and a look at a 16th century painting now on display in Washington, D.C. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, and for Lauren Ashburn. Pope Francis declares war on bullying. El bullying es un fenómeno de autocompensación. 
The Holy Father says bullying mostly is about being selfish and trying to tear people down to make yourself feel better. He says the remedy is not sold in a pharmacy. Instead, the cure is to be brave enough to take time to talk and listen to one another. Catholic artist Jacopo Tintoretto was one of the most prolific 16th century Venetian religious painters. Now, for the first time in North America, the National Gallery of Art is exhibiting some of his work. Lauren Ashburn explores the beauty of faith in the painting The Last Supper, featured in Tintoretto, artist of Renaissance Venice. Joining me now is Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Hi, Jem. Welcome back. Thank you, Lauren. It's great to be back, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Sunday is the Feast of the, of the Body and Blood of Christ. It's fitting that we look at this painting called The Last Supper. Tell us why Jesus is illuminated in this. The light around him is very pronounced. Tintoretto was a man of deep religious faith and a painter of extraordinary talent. Uh, his paintings are bold, uh, he has muscular, large-scale figures, his brushwork is loose and fluid, and he captures movement in the most dramatic way. Right, they're he, all leaning over the table here, and it seems that the apostles are very engaged. That's right. What, you know, what he does is he, is he paints this scene of the Last Supper some nine times, and this work is one of his greatest achievements. He gathers the figures in a triangular composition with Jesus at the head, and what Tintoretto wants to do is focus our gaze, fix our gaze on Jesus, his calm, serene face, uh, radiating light. Why? Because this is the moment when Jesus is giving his disciples and us his greatest gift, the gift of his body and blood as he institutes the Eucharist. I see a hovering figure here in the background, I'm guessing Judas. Well, Tintoretto captures this dramatic moment at the Last Supper when Jesus tells his disciples that one of them is about to betray him. And so we know from the Gospel of John that it is Peter, the Apostle Peter, who reaches out to Jesus and says, Lord, tell us, tell us who is going to betray you. Um, and then there is this figure of Judas lurking in the background to indicate his shadowy act of betrayal. Uh, that he's about to complete that will lead Jesus to his suffering and his death on the cross for our salvation. So there's this wonderful sense of light and shadow uh, to evoke that sense of um, the, the contrast between Jesus' act of love and this act of betrayal. I was uh, struck by the, the I was going to say the costumes, but the, the clothing. Um, I've never seen Jesus in pink. It looks pink and there's a blue, I guess, blanket around him. Tell us more about about the dress that he chose. There's marvelous details in this painting, of course. Um, the pink is probably more of a reddish uh, pink, uh, <laughs> and, and the blue, uh, always we see Jesus in, in red and blue, indicating his divinity and his humanity, clothed in the one divine person of the Son of God. There's also other wonderful details, the, the table, the wooden table, the, the, the simple meal, the rustic uh, um, uh, chairs, all of this to indicate this poverty, the simplicity of this moment that is really a rich spiritual feast. And this can be seen in Washington, D.C. at the National Gallery of Art. Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Thank you so much for walking us through this amazing work of art. Thank you, Lauren. And our thanks to Lauren Ashburn and Jim Sullivan. And our thanks to you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back on Monday with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.